Good morning, everybody. My name is Tim Wilson, and I am the uh, parliamentary chair of the uh, Friends of uh, Action, uh, Parliamentary Friends of Action on HIV, STIs, and bloodborne viruses. And it's wonderful to welcome you all to this online event. Hopefully, the last one we ever have to do online uh, for World AIDS Day 2021. And uh, uh, it's one of the few days in the year that I wear a different pin. Um, normally, I just wear the flag of Australia, but uh, it's an opportunity to always uh, acknowledge those uh, we've lost and, of course, support those uh, who are living with HIV and also, of course, to celebrate the incredible work of uh, the community that has uh, enabled us uh, to be in a situation where uh, we can um, uh, HIV and AIDS no longer um, a terminal condition, but of course, one uh, that can be managed and to look to the future and what we can learn also in this time, of course, critically uh, towards the future and what we can do to support in other conditions. Um, I have a great pleasure of uh, hosting with my parliamentary co-chair, uh, Louis, Senator Louise Pratt, uh, this morning's event, which of course has a star-studded lineup uh, of ministerial uh, uh, and uh, shadow ministerial lights uh, to offer their perspectives on this important day. But my first role is to welcome Michael Doyle, who is the FAO board director uh, to Acknowledge Country. Uh, good morning, everybody, and thank you to the Honourable Tim Wilson for hosting us this morning. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Michael Doyle. I'm a Bardi man and senior research fellow at Sydney University, uh, and I am a board member of FAO, as mentioned, at but also the Anukana National Alliance (ANA). I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners, the lands upon which uh, I'm joining you today. I'm in Redfern, so I pay my respects to the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. I'd also like to pay respects to the traditional owners of all the lands upon which you may be joining us this morning from across Australia and pay respects to elders past, present uh, and emerging and acknowledge all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are joining us this morning. Um, on this very important day, I also want to acknowledge the elders who work within the HIV sector, both Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander and non-Indigenous alike, and thank them for their work over many decades. AFAO and ANA have a strong track record uh, working in Australia with Indigenous peoples, and this work continues. As an Aboriginal man and a board member of AFAO, I am extremely proud of AFAO's ability to work with minorities, including Indigenous peoples globally. Uh, I look forward to the, hearing the rest of the speakers this morning, and I'll hand back now to the Honourable Tim Wilson. Thank you, Michael, very much for that acknowledgement of country. And uh, it's very important, particularly when we understand the challenges of uh, spread of HIV and other uh, uh, viruses uh, in Indigenous communities, and that's obviously something that uh, is uh, part of the national conversation, the context of COVID as well, uh, not just to acknowledge carry a country, but also, of course, to acknowledge uh, the important work that still needs to be done in those communities as well. Uh, next, I'd like to welcome Peter Sands, who's the Executive Director of the Global Fund uh, since March 2018. He's also a former Chief Executive of one of the world's largest international banks and a research fellow at Harvard University and uh, uh, has an important, obviously plays a critical and important role uh, in the global fight against AIDS, TB and malaria. Uh, please welcome Peter. Thank you very much. And let me start by special thanks to Foreign Minister Maurice Payne, Shadow Foreign Minister Penny Wong, uh, for, and to Australia as a whole, uh, for Australia's long-standing support to the Global Fund to fight AIDS, TB, and malaria. I'd also like to thank you, Tim, and Senator Louise Pratt um, for the invitation to speak and for FAO for organizing this. This is a particularly important World AIDS Day. 2021 marks 40 years since the first cases of what was later to be found to be HIV were reported and 20 years since the creation of the Global Fund. And in the context of what we're facing right now with COVID and the latest variants, it's important to remember that HIV was the last big pandemic to strike 
humanity. 20 years ago, HIV seemed unbeatable. It was exploding, particularly across Africa. But over the course of the last two decades, global solidarity, huge mobilization of science, communities, governments across the world has turned the tide. And one of the game-changing moments was actually the creation of the Global Fund, uh, uh, an act of global solidarity that when you think about the struggles to get a common global approach right now, seems quite extraordinary in retrospect. Since its creation, the Global Fund has invested 26.5 billion US dollars, 22.7 in programs directly for HIV AIDS and 3.8 billion in TB HIV across more than 100 countries. And over that period, in the countries in which the Global Fund invests, AIDS-related deaths have dropped by 65% and new infections have been reduced by 54%. So while nothing can diminish the death toll, the extraordinary loss of life that we have seen with HIV AIDS, we should also acknowledge the extraordinary achievement in turning around what was a catastrophe and bringing down the death toll and infection rate so markedly. Yes, we were off track before COVID struck, but we had made significant progress. Yet COVID has been a disaster for HIV, TB, and malaria. Of those three diseases, TB has probably been the worst affected, but HIV has, we have seen reverse programmatic results on HIV for the first time in the 20 year history of the Global Fund. And it particularly on the prevention side. So reach of prevention programs, PMTCT testing, all these declined. In fact, on the treatment side in 2020, we saw an increase in the number of people receiving antiretroviral treatment, which is really testimony to the fantastic efforts of communities and programs across the world to protect and sustain HIV antiretroviral treatment. The Global Fund responded very swiftly to the pandemic. From March 2020, we began deploying incremental resources, extra resources to countries, both to enable them to respond directly to the pandemic itself and to mitigate the impact on TB and malaria. Since then, we have deployed an additional $4 billion, over $4 billion, through the mechanism we call C19RM, our COVID-19 response mechanism. And this is on top of the roughly $4 billion a year we invest in HIV, TB, and malaria programs. To bring this to the Australian context, in the Asia-Pacific region, the Global Fund has approved an additional 580 million US dollars to 29 countries that are an in interest to in Australia, including 10.5 million to PNG and 66 million to Indonesia. And to give you a flavor of what the money was spent on, 72% went into reinforcing the national COVID response. So countries such as India, Indonesia, and the Philippines that were hit hard by Delta procured oxygen, or therapeutics like dexamethasone, testing, and PPE. In fact, the Global Fund has been the largest provider of grant support to low and middle income countries across the world for the non-vaccine components of their COVID responses. 19% went to mitigating the impact on TB, HIV, and malaria programs, and 9% for urgent improvements in health and community systems. COVID-19 has also catalyzed a multitude of innovations. Some of them totally new, some of them things we knew were a good idea, but it was taking too long 
to get them uh, deployed and accepted. So we've seen more co-testing for infectious diseases. We've seen a swift to switch to multi-month dispensing of an antiretrovirals, much greater use of self-testing, much greater use of digital tools for prevention activities and treatment support. But we have gone backwards in critical aspects of the HIV fight. So in 2020, we saw an 11% decrease in the numbers of people in the countries across which the Global Fund Invest reach with HIV prevention services, and the numbers of people tested fell by 22%. And looking at the more recent data in 21, we, are, we have seen a decline in HIV um, antiretroviral treatment enrollment rates. The other thing that has been very disconcerting about the impact of COVID-19 is that it has fueled the inequities that we know also are massive barriers to progress on HIV. Indeed, pandemics, whether it's HIV or COVID-19, exacerbate and thrive on inequity. Again and again, we see the same people, the poorest, the most marginalized, being the ones who suffer most from pandemics. And as we mark World AIDS Day, we must, we must really acknowledge this, that we're not going to beat the most formidable infectious dis diseases, diseases like HIV and COVID-19, if we only think of them as scientific and medical problems. We've got to address the underlying inequities. And that just isn't just the inequities between countries, as we're seeing with the issues around COVID-19 vaccines, but it's the inequities within countries, the inequities that revolve around who you are. We have seen within HIV staggering differences in the vulnerability to infection of those in key populations who are denied access to the information, the tools, the services to protect them. So transgender women are 34 more times likely to acquire HIV than other adults. Female sex workers are 26 times more likely. Gay men and other men who have sex with men are 25, more time, 25 times more likely. These are aggregate statistics. In some countries they're lower, in some countries they're higher, but across again and again we see repeated that key populations who are criminalized, discriminated against, stigmatized, who face human rights and gender related barriers to receiving health services are massively more vulnerable to HIV. And this is extremely relevant in the Asia-Pacific region, where unfortunately progress against HIV continues to be extraordinarily uneven. We have some countries that have had dramatic improvements in HIV infections, such as Thailand and Vietnam. We have some places where the HIV epidemics are growing um, at alarming rate um, among key populations, such as in Indonesia and Philippines. And we have across the region, an HIV pandemic, which is deeply characterized by a concentration among those key populations facing human rights and gender related barriers. And COVID-19 has exacerbated those barriers and exacerbated the exposure of these communities and individuals. This fundamental fact about the nature of the HIV pandemic, and I, I deliberately use the word pandemic rather than epidemic because I don't think we should um, allow what tends to happen with pandemics, which is when they stop killing large numbers of people in the richest countries of the world, we tend to reclassify them. Um, we should recognize that HIV continues to be a pandemic, continues to uh, kill too many people and blight communities across the world. One 
critical aspect of the fight against HIV, which I think becomes all the more important when you consider how much of a role in the epidemiology, human rights and gender related barriers play is the role of communities. Communities, enabling communities to protect and serve themselves has been demonstrated again, again, to be a critical part of fighting HIV. And indeed, Australia pioneered community-led responses to HIV in the early 90s and was one of the earliest examples of governments working with and supporting community-led interventions. During the pandemic, the Global Fund has been actively supporting community-led interventions to help mitigate the impact of COVID-19 on, on HIV. So for example, in um, the Philippines, we um, supported the expansion of innovative approaches such as one-stop shop for key populations, self-testing, virtual outreach, and introducing PrEP. Or PNG, where we um, supported key population outreach workers to ensure better access to uh, gender-based violence services, including prevention and support. But we need to do more. We need to make community-led interventions more central, more effective, and more pervasive across all the countries in the region if we are going to achieve the progress we need to achieve against HIV. And this is why in the strategy for the Global Fund that's just been approved, the central focus is on the role of people and communities themselves. That winning against diseases like HIV, TB and malaria, and frankly, COVID-19 itself can only be done when we empower communities to protect themselves. And we remove the kinds of barriers, human rights, gender related, that, that thwart communities from accessing such services. I think it's one of the big lessons that we have been slow to learn with COVID from the fight against HIV AIDS is the role of communities. Many countries' COVID-19 responses have been very top down and have struggled to build the trust with communities that we know from all the experience of HIV is critical to beating a formidable infectious disease. And I think it's very important that we do learn that lesson as we go into the next phase of the fight against COVID-19, because as recent, uh, recent events, the emergence of Omicron um, demonstrate, this is a fight that is far from over. But also that we learn the same lesson as we talk about pandemic preparedness, that pandemic preparedness should not be just a sort of technocratic scientific approach, but should be an approach that engages and involves communities and builds the trust that is such a critical asset in any response to an infectious disease outbreak. So just to close, I think World AIDS Day 2021 is an opportunity to remember the far too many people who died the lessons we've learned, the things we've done well, but also the things we've done badly. It's shocking to think of how long it took to get antiretroviral medicines out of the rich countries and into the poorer parts of the world. We should learn the lessons from HIV and apply them to COVID-19, but there are also lessons from COVID-19 we should apply to HIV. For example, I think in the COVID-19 we have shown that some of the assumptions around how long it takes to develop new medical tools and how quickly they can be deployed can be broken. We could do it faster. 
And when I think how, far, how long it has taken um, in many parts of the world, for example, to deploy new antiretroviral re regimens or new tools for prevention, I think there's a lesson here we should learn. But above all, I think the big lesson we should learn is that we need collectively as a global community to fight and beat these infectious diseases like COVID-19, like HIV, like TB and malaria. We should not leave the fights half won. We should not leave people behind. And we should recognize that part of the battle is scientific and medical, and part of the battle is around human rights and gender-related barriers. I'll close there, but as I say, I am delighted to be able to participate, and I, I really do want to thank Australia again for the fantastic support you've shown the Global Fund. Thank you. Good morning. My name's Tony Kelleher. I'm the, the director of the Kirby Institute in Sydney. Thank you, Peter, for taking time out of what must be an extraordinarily busy schedule. And I guess we've got in first due to the, the differences in the time across the globe. Uh, and to make, to, you know, uh, develop, uh, deliver the opening remarks this morning for the 2021 World AIDS Parliamentary Breakfast and to remind us how important concerted uh, community-led partnerships are in the fight against pandemics like HIV, AIDS, TB, and malaria, and for highlighting in particular the need for generosity in collaboration to ensure that the most vulnerable uh, populations, especially those key populations, have equitable access to healthcare. And to remind us of the challenges we still face, particularly in our region, in the unfinished fight against HIV AIDS related to access to diagnosis, treatment and prevention. It is now my honour to introduce Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator the Honourable Maurice Payne, and acknowledge her leadership in this sector, particularly her leadership in driving Australia's contribution of $242 million in 2019 to the sixth replenishment of the Global Fund to support global efforts to end HIV trans transmission, for her leadership of Australia's continued support, continued support for UN AIDS, and her demonstrable ongoing interest in Australia's HIV response, including spending time as a board member of AFAO's New South Wales member organisation, ACON, in the 1990s. I'd also like to point out her department's very recent and current support for initiatives of laboratory capacity building uh, for the diagnosis and monitoring of HIV, TB and malaria in the, in the context of the COVID ec epidemic in the countries across our region. And in particular, uh, for the department's support for molecular testing, both viral load and uh, sequencing uh, of virus in neonates, child, uh, children and uh, mothers in, uh, across PNG, particularly rural PNG. Over, over to you, uh, Senator Payne. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. And Tony, thank you very much for uh, your very generous acknowledgement uh, and that very warm welcome. This is a long and very important association for me uh, and I appreciate uh, the honour you do me by inviting me to speak here again this morning. Uh, may I also uh, acknowledge uh, Peter Sands, the Executive Director of the Global Fund, uh, and uh, thank you Peter for joining us uh, virtually today. I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet this morning for this parliamentary breakfast, in my case the land of the Ngunnawal people, and send my respects to their elders past and present and emerging. I also acknowledge my parliamentary colleagues who are participating this morning, my ministerial colleagues, shadow ministerial colleagues, and the chair and deputy chair of the Parliamentary Friends for Action on HIV AIDS, uh, Assistant Minister Tim Wilson and Senator Louise Pratt. This is an important annual event. 
well, this year it is once again virtual, and I did see Helen Evans' post about Zoom fatigue, and I tend to agree. Uh, it is uh, nevertheless always a pleasure to gather with distinguished leaders in the HIV response, together with our parliamentary colleagues. And we do gather in a notable milestone year. As Peter Sands said, 2021 marks 40 years since the first cases of AIDS were officially reported, 25 years since UN AIDS was established, and 20 years since the Global Fund was created. We have seen remarkable progress during this time, and that includes in our neighbourhood. In the Indo-Pacific region, AIDS-related deaths declined by 56% over the 10-year period from 2010. This achievement is a testament to the hard work of countless people over these many decades, including many of you here today and many that we have lost and who we acknowledge and remember today. Our scientists, our healthcare workers, our activists, civil society groups, all working with governments to improve the lives of millions of people. But there is much more work to be done. And Peter, your words this morning uh, were very compelling and a very important reminder to us all, particularly your reinforcement of the importance of community, particularly your reminder of Australia's long focus on community engagement. And also, again, thank Tony Kelleher for his acknowledgement of the work that uh, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and indeed the Department of Health in Australia uh, do in these areas. We also know that the impact of COVID-19 on the HIV response is devastating. It has disrupted HIV programs. It is exacerbating those inequalities that Peter spoke about that drive the HIV epidemic. And it is exposing the fragility of hard fought uh, and valuable gains. We can see this in declines in HIV prevention and testing services, including the drop in the number of people who are being reached with HIV prevention programs. It's sensible that in moving forward with the HIV response, we also need to address COVID-19 and its impacts in our region. Our objective must also be to prevent health systems and workforces being diverted from broader health efforts. And in part, that is why in Australia's commitment to uh, sharing 60 million doses of COVID-19 vaccines with countries in Southeast Asia and the Pacific by the end of next year, we are also ensuring that we are backing in those health systems with support to provide them that structure around COVID vaccine delivery that will not detract from their own, stand, their own health system fundamentals. We have a strong record, as has been acknowledged, and I'm very grateful for those acknowledgements of supporting the global HIV response. We also have a strong record in this country, of which I'm proud, of a bipartisan or nonpartisan uh, approach to these issues across our parliament. We've been a top contributor of core funding to UNAIDS over a long period, and uh, our contribution to the Global Fund is uh, at $920 million since its inception. And I know what outstanding work both organisations do, uh, and we are proud to support them. I was pleased to affirm Australia's resolute commitment to working with UNAIDS in my meeting with Executive Director uh, Winnie Bianyema in Geneva in May of this year. This year, Australia and Namibia also facilitated, uh, co-facilitated the political declaration adopted at the UN General Assembly high-level meeting on HIV AIDS in June. I particularly thank AFAO, who joined Australia's delegation and worked hard to support our engagement with civil, to civil society to ensure it was an integral part of the declaration. It was a very, very good collaborative effort, and I want to thank and acknowledge the efforts of all those involved. The Declaration is a new global commitment on the way forward. It puts human rights, science and addressing inequalities at the centre of the HIV response. And we'll be guided by the Declaration in responding to the challenges ahead and in how we maintain momentum in the HIV response. 
In the Indo-Pacific region, we continue to work with UNAIDS to improve access to HIV prevention and testing services for vulnerable populations. In Cambodia, in Indonesia, in Papua New Guinea and the Philippines, this collaboration includes working with government and civil society to support community-led organisations to improve prevention and testing services and address inequality, stigma and discrimination that is faced by people living with HIV. We are clear on what needs to be done and we have not and will not falter. We are committed to continuing our work together to end the HIV AIDS epidemic. So to all our colleagues and my many friends, thank you for coming together this morning to demonstrate our unwavering commitment to meeting that goal. I apologise that I'm not able to stay for the entire meeting. Uh, parliamentary commitments uh, uh, preclude that this morning, but my very best wishes and again, my thanks for bringing together today's meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Uh, I certainly know that for many years, you've been a strong advocate for those living with and affected by HIV as we all do here. Uh, not only in Australia, but in the region and especially for women. And um, so we very much appreciate your continued and clearly genuine support in helping uh, address the ongoing HIV pandemic, as Peter has told us and reminded us that that's really what HIV is, the last big pandemic, and it still is a major pandemic in the world. And for me, you know, can I also congratulate you and the government on being out of the blocks very strongly and early in support of the regional COVID response um, and for building a strong team that, that I'm one of many who work with that take this program forward. You know, you know the, the challenge is obviously immense. We just talked, you just mentioned, um, you know, delivering our 60 million doses over, over a whole year. It's so a whole world is facing that sort of time frame. And so that the challenge is immense and ongoing and, and of course changing as we've seen with this new variant um, and we will, yeah, and I especially will be seeking more from government, we all must do more, but I, I, I want to express my genuine sense of gratitude to you uh, from the global health community here in Australia. I was going to say a few words on, on HIV but um, Minister yourself and Peter have sort of already marked uh, some words about the Global Fund, the extraordinary um, work of the Global Fund and and progress on HIV as a result um, of that and other efforts. Um, I, I just want to emphasize that, you know, I think Peter's very much touched on this and the Global Fund is of course already doing it as the Global Fund for HIV, TB and malaria. If we're to prevent, you know, severe disruptions caused by COVID-19 from having um, a devastating long-term impact, we've, we've obviously got to scale up our efforts to regain lost progress in other areas, um, and especially to tackle the inequalities that we've already talked about that fuel the epidemic. But my personal view is that we need to use this, you know, extraordinary surge in COVID response for something positive, the health system strengthening nature of that, to simultaneously progress HIV and other major global health challenges, malaria, TB in particular, maternal and child health also, you know, to synergize, to piggyback. And while Global health, I worry, can seem like a shopping list of problems, of which COVID is one more. Um, HIV and the work of the Global Fund and others has taught us that, you, you, you know, um, solutions can be integrated. You can tackle one and see progress um, on the other. And so that's what you know, I'm, I'm very much hoping that we will see, as well as, as, as Peter has said, we won't be shunting COVID-19 to the poorer um, parts of the world and think the pandemic is over. Let's tackle it for everybody. And, and boy, has HIV taught us how important that is. It's now my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Senator the Honourable Penny Wong, the Shadow Minister for Foreign Affairs. As everyone here knows, uh, uh, the Honourable Penny Wong is a member of this ALP. She was elected to the Senate in 2001 and took her seat um, uh, the next year in 2002. Uh, just over 10 years later, uh, Senator Wong was appointed leader of the government in the Senate and, and later, for obvious reasons, was appointed leader of the opposition in the Senate and she's the first woman to hold both of these roles. In 2008, uh, she became the first Asian-born member of the Australian Cabinet, the first openly LGBTI Australian federal parliamentarian and federal government cabinet minister and supported legalised same-sex marriage in Australia. 
Uh, Senator Wong is committed to doing, clearly doing all she can to ease the burdens of HIV, not only in Australia, um, but especially amongst our First Nations people and, and, and across the region. She's a strong advocate against prejudice uh, and discrimination and an active com campaigner, as we all know on this call, for equality for women and LGBTI rights. Would you please welcome the Shadow Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator the Honourable Penny Wong. Thank you very much for that introduction, uh, uh, Brendan. I appreciate it. And thank you to, to all of you, to the parliamentary friends, uh, to FAO and to all the organisations who are involved today for their um, participation and uh, organisation of this breakfast and for the invitation to speak. And I start by acknowledging the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples and acknowledging their traditional custodianship of this region. Uh, and uh, thanks to Michael for the acknowledgement of country. But most of all today, I do want to acknowledge those who are living with HIV AIDS. Uh, your visibility and advocacy have always been uh, the driving force behind this fight, and they are still crucial for overcoming stigma and educating the community. The policy development and research that Australia undertakes to achieve best practice and to end HIV transmission, including by many of the people who are represented or who are here today and the organisations represented here today. It couldn't happen uh, without the leadership of the community and it couldn't happen without the leadership of those uh, who are living with HIV AIDS. So I wanna thank you. This is a really important event. Uh, it's an event which reaffirms bipartisanship, uh, a, a quality that's probably been a little rarer than perhaps we would like, and certainly as we head towards an election, rarer still. Uh, but it reminds us of the bipartisanship that is needed uh, to end HIV transmission. Uh, and it is also always an event where we should remember those who have lost their lives in the 40 years uh, uh, since this pandemic began. Across the world, more than 30 million have lost their lives. It is a tragedy with few comparisons. Uh, and as we now aim to end, end HIV transmission in Australia, we need to step up where we are falling short. And that does include greater efforts to eliminate transmission amongst Indigenous Australians who, as we know, have a rate of diagnosis double that of non-Indigenous. It's an example of the way in which inequality exacerbates health risks, something that a number of the previous speakers have spoken about. Uh, but we also know that this is a fight that doesn't end at our shores and we must work with the world and in the world, starting with our neighbours. Almost six million people in the Asia Pacific region live with HIV. Many are not receiving treatment and now are in countries with strained health systems because of the pandemic, COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, COVID-19 outbreaks have and will continue to impede the region's social and economic development. So it has never been more important for Australia to support our region to ensure health capacity strengthen and that progress towards eliminating HIV transmission isn't hampered. Put simply, the health and prosperity of our region is at stake if Australia doesn't play its part. Uh, it is disappointing that Australia's international leadership and contribution uh, is constrained by consistent reductions in budgeted amounts for official development assistance. And uh, as I have consistently done at every breakfast, I again offer Senator Payne and the government our willingness to return to bipartisanship on development assistance that this country had until 2013-14. Finally, I just want to close on this point. Uh, Peter in his uh, address spoke of the demonstration of solidarity that has been intrinsic to the global response to HIV. Um, and I say to this group, let's both be inspired by and reprise that again today. Thank you very much for having me. Like Maurice, I'm afraid I'll have to depart to parliamentary meetings, but I really do appreciate the work of uh, all those on the school, all the organisations, as I said, particularly at FAO and to my parliamentary colleagues in both parliamentary friends, but also uh, my ministerial and shadow ministerial colleagues. So thank you very much for inviting me to speak. Hello everybody, good morning. My name is Mark Orr. I'm the National President of the Australian Federation of AIDS Organisations. And I just want to um, uh, echo Brendan's um, warm welcome to Senator Wong. And thank you, Senator, for attending yet another World AIDS Day breakfast. Um, I can't count the number that you've been to, and we thank you for your continuing support for Australia's role, both domestically and regionally in the HIV response. 
I'd now like to move on to um, introduce uh, Adam Bantz, uh, the federal member for Melbourne, who's the leader of the Australian Greens. The Australian Greens are an important part of Australia's multi-partisan um, commitments and collaboration around the HIV response, both uh, in each of our jurisdictions and nationally. And Adam, I'd like to hand over to you. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much. And it's really delightful to be here at my um, first breakfast as leader of the Greens. I want to acknowledge all of my parliamentary colleagues and also distinguished guests, um, many of whom are from Melbourne. And it says something about this year that I don't get to see you in Melbourne, but when I get to see you, it's online while I'm in Canberra. But su such is life at the moment. And um, hopefully, thanks in large part to the good work that you've been doing in Melbourne, uh, hopefully we'll be able to catch up in person soon. I also want to acknowledge the Ngunnawal people and the First Nations people of wherever we happen to be meeting on today. Um, First Nations people are being diagnosed with HIV at more than double the rate of diagnosis amongst non-Indigenous people born in Australia. And that's part of the reason that FAO's Agenda 2025 is so important. And um, I'd like to spend a little bit of my time this morning talking about Agenda 2025. Part of this crucial plan will address and remove barriers to HIV testing and treatment for First Nations people, leading to better health outcomes for everyone in our communities. And while new HIV diagnoses have declined 75% amongst gay and bisexual men in inner cities over the last five years, there's still a long way to go towards seeing this decline across the rest of Australia. We must all, uh, as, especially as politicians, um, urgently commit to removing barriers to accessing HIV testing treatment uh, for First Nations people, for migrant communities and people living outside inner cities. Agenda 2025 will remove these barriers. Agenda 2025, ending HIV transmission in Australia, is a consensus statement that draws on the expertise of the nation's top HIV clinicians researchers and community leaders, including the Australian Federation of AIDS organisations, the Kirby Institute, the Doherty Institute, and many others. Through targeted and fully costed public health interventions, Agenda 2025 will virtually eliminate HIV transmission in Australia within the next four years. We have made extraordinary progress and virtual elimination of HIV is in reach. And I wanna take a moment to all my other parliamentary colleagues to just congratulate and acknowledge the work that people uh, on this event have done, but also that uh, community organizations have done and also the communities themselves. So this is an extraordinary, extraordinary achievement to, uh, to get this within reach. But virtual elimination won't happen without new policy and additional investment. Um, as has been remarked, we are uh, in a position where we're heading towards an election. And I want to let you know that the Greens commit that our fully costed election platform will include every aspect of the Agenda 2025 plan to eliminate HIV transmission within four years, dedicating $53 million to fund peak organisations, remove out-of-pocket costs for HIV testing and treatment, regardless of visa status, and to fund education programs to remove uh, to reduce HIV stigma. Eliminating HIV transmission isn't something that's beyond our control. If we choose to fund this program, we can do it. $53 million is eminently affordable and it is a terrific investment. And that's why today the Greens are committing to support $53 million needed to remove barriers to testing and treatment for HIV, including out-of-pocket costs, to fund the edu education programs and to end HIV stigma for good. Um, we are 100% behind the entirety of FAO's Agenda 2025, and we do commend the work of FAO to keep the issue of ending HIV transmission on the political agenda. And we congratulate FAO for bringing us all together this morning. Thanks very much for uh, letting me speak as my first address to you all as leader. And um, I hope to join you again sometime soon. Thank you, Adam, for those words. And thank you for highlighting the importance of focusing on First Nations community to discuss uh, HIV and AIDS. And uh, thank you for also 
acknowledging the importance of this grand coalition, which is represented here at this event today, the coalition between people living with HIV, affected communities, clinicians, researchers, and indeed politicians um, that has served us so well since those early days in the 80s when Dr. Neil Blewett and Professor Peter Bowen came together and, and started this approach to within the parliament to progress our national approach, our world approach to HIV prevention, treatment and care. I'd now like to um, uh, introduce the Minister for Health, the Honourable Greg Hunt. Uh, Minister Hunt has been the Minister for Health since 2017 and has been a fantastic supporter of um, our work our collective work in HIV and AIDS domestically um, throughout that time. In the midst of all the other uh, demands on his time and uh, attention as the Minister for Health in, a, in the National Parliament. Um, the Minister has had many uh, achievements uh, in our area, including um, achieving PBS subsidisation of PrEP, the approval of Australia's first HIV self-test and funding the joint NAPWA FAO Workplace Capacity Building Initiative, HOLA. And with that, I'd like to um, welcome Mr Hunt. Thanks very much to, uh, to Mark and to Daryl, uh, to all of my parliamentary colleagues, but in particular, Louise and Tim for, for their leadership. Uh, I want to acknowledge my uh, shadow minister counterpart, uh, Mark Butler, who's been uh, a very strong bipartisan advocate in this space. Um, but above all else, to acknowledge all of the advocates, the leaders, uh, the lived experience uh, community from within Australia's HIV community. And we know that the challenge in Indigenous Australia is greater than uh, in uh, non-Indigenous Australia. And so this is a really profound and important step forward. But uh, I have a very simple and, and happy task today, Mark, and that is uh, to make two simple announcements, which together represent a, a $50 million additional investment on uh, World AIDS Day, but it's not, not the money. It's the fact that we will be providing additional support and access uh, to HIV services and treatment. And so one of the abiding goals of Agenda 25, which Tim and Louise set down to me, which Daryl O'Donnell set down to me, was to ensure that we had Medicare access for non-Medicare eligible HIV patients. And I am delighted to announce uh, that we will, for the first time of any government, open Medicare access for HIV treatment to non-Medicare eligible patients. And uh, that's uh, profoundly important. It's an investment of $39 million, but it's a human investment. It recognizes the needs, it recognizes the rights, it recognizes the contribution to achieving this goal of eliminating transmission by 2025. And um, basically it takes care of people. It's as simple as that, it's taking care of people. And you were the ones that proposed it both within the parliamentary group and within the FAO and the broader HIV AIDS advocacy community. The second thing is to announce $11 million in support uh, for peak bodies in the HIV AIDS sector. So together $50 million, but it's just allowing you to continue to expand upon your work. Um, I think to, to quote Tennyson's Ulysses, to strive, to seek, to find, but not to yield. I know you guys, you're not going to yield. You're going to keep going. And uh, I think that's what's so important and so heartening. So today, um, those contributions of uh, access to uh, Medicare for previously non-Medicare eligible uh, patients who are in Australia with uh, HIV AIDS uh, and the support for the peak bodies to continue their support for the work on HIV AIDS. I thank you, I honour you, and uh, I wish everybody strength and fortitude and hope and optimism and on World AIDS Day. Everyone, uh, I'm Aaron Cogle. I'm the Executive Director of the National Association for People with HIV. Minister Hunt, thank you for those announcements. That will make a huge difference to the lives of positive people in Australia who won't any longer have to 
um, use precarious means uh, to access treatments if they don't have access to Medicare. Um, I've been working on this for about 10 years, and so I just want to say that uh, uh, NAFWA and AFEO are incredibly uh, thankful both for your commitment to the peak organisations and for working with us uh, for such a long time in order to get such a successful outcome. So thank you, I really appreciate it. Um, so uh, we're now going to have a um, panel discussion. Oh, before I do that, I should mention uh, that Mark Butler, the Shadow Health Minister, is unable to join us today. Uh, so we're going to move on to a panel discussion now. But before I do that, I just want to take a moment for another acknowledgement. Our World AIDS Day breakfasts have been happening every year for the last 10 years. So it seems right that on this occasion, occasion I acknowledge someone, that person who conceived of these breakfasts uh, a decade ago, and that's Bill Botel. Napa and Afeo would like to note our thanks to Bill for his commitment and dedication and for his inspirational idea, uh, which has been such a success over these last 10 years. And with that uh, said, I'd like to welcome back the Honourable Tim Wilson, the Chair of the Parliamentary Friends for Action on HIV, BBV and STIs, uh, to introduce the expert panel members. Tim. Uh, thanks very much for that, Aaron, and it's uh, great to be back. And thank you, everyone, for your contributions uh, already. And of course, any announcement of funding or support is critical because it's been made mentioned before, one of the reasons this group is so successful is because we work in a non-partisan way to get outcomes and uh, we're very proud of that. We now have a panel discussion um, in our remaining time uh, and we uh, have a number of people who obviously bring their different perspectives and value to the conversation, including Sharon Lewinao, who's a leading infectious diseases expert. Uh, everybody knows her in the sector and is the inaugural director of the Doherty Institute. Carla Trillo, uh, who's a professor of the director of the Centre for Social Research and Health and Social Policy Research Centre. Jason Ong, or Associate Professor Jason, Dr. Jason Ong, <coughs> is a sexual health physician and health economist based at Melbourne Sexual Health Centre. Professor uh, Tony Kelleher is a clinician uh, and clinician scientist and the director of the Kirby Institute at UNSW. Uh, Nick Medland is a senior researcher at the NHMRC Research Fellow with the Surveillance, Evaluation and Research Program of the Kirby Institute. He's also president of ASHAM and uh, Brent Clifton from NAPFWA, who's the project officer at NAPFWA. We were supposed to have with us Dawn Casey also this morning, but unfortunately uh, she has had to withdraw. So we acknowledge her contribution and wish her all the best. Uh, and I'd now like um, to open the panel discussion by asking Tony, uh, basically that the combined global effort to address COVID-19 was heroic and unprecedented, but what are the lessons for HIV, especially when it comes to translating research into practice. Thanks, Tim. Uh, and I just want to echo um, the uh, full support uh, and thanks for uh, the funding of the Medicare ineligibles. As a clinician, I think that's going to make a huge difference. So from the point of view of a clinician and a lab jock, I think HIV established the effectiveness and the importance of molecular testing uh, in the diagnosis and monitoring of viral illnesses. Uh, HIV was the vehicle that established these relatively new techniques like PCR and sequencing uh, that now underpin uh, much of our response to COVID-19. HIV also introduced us to the concept of viral variability and particularly the ability of the virus to avoid immune responses through this process called immune escape. Uh, and clearly, uh, much of our worry about the variants of, control, uh, variants of concern in COVID are around the response uh, our vaccines will have to these viruses because of the virus perhaps uh, evolving in such a way to escape those vaccine responses. So those very concepts that are driving uh, the responses to the variants uh, come from our understanding of the biology of viruses driven by HIV. Furthermore, uh, and more importantly, HIV demonstrated that the need for effective, generous collaboration, that big problems need big partnerships, and these must be of complementary expertise, and in pandemics, they must reach beyond national borders. Further, and mo more importantly, the responses must be, to must be collaborative 
and to be effective, they must involve the community and all sections, as Peter said, of the affected community. Scientists, clinicians, public health officials must work with government and industry, but they must all work with community to, to generate effective responses against these pandemic viral illnesses. And HIV has shown that disseminated models of care work. In pandemics like HIV and COVID, the community is global, and so effective responses must extend beyond national borders and they must be fair and equitable. If they aren't, then the biology of these mutable viruses will come back to bite us. Look at the sequential challenges of Delta, Beta and Omicron. If you relax uh, before you've looked after the last person that is infected or is likely to be infected, then this virus and other viruses will come back to bite you. Hello, it's Senator Louise Pratt, Tim's co-chair here. I've got a question now for Nick Medland. We know that there's an increasing proportion of HIV that's diagnosed amongst new migrants and newly arrived Australians. What challenges does this pose for our response? And perhaps in this context, the significance of the announcement today? Thank you, Louise. I certainly can explain why this is such an important area. And again, just wonderful to hear the announcement from Minister Hunt today announcing HIV treatment funding in this group. Uh, and can't wait to see it um, uh, rolling, rolled out. Spent um, uh, many hours with patients in clinic, uh, working out how to get them get treatment for them. It is a, um, a terrible advance. It's a terrific advance. Uh, it's now become clear that particularly gay and bisexual men coming from overseas are more vulnerable than others to, to being exposed to HIV after they arrive in Australia. For these individuals, it can be devastating. HIV often makes them ineligible for residence visas. And they may have to return to countries where life for people living with HIV is harsh. Secondly, we've heard multiple times today, Australia is committed to eliminating HIV transmission. And we know from COVID that pockets of vulnerability directly undermine controlling, control of the epidemic, control of the pandemic. Testing, preventive medications, PrEP and treatment works to eliminate new HIV infections, but only if there's the same high coverage across the board. So in Australia, we've managed to optimise our healthcare system successfully to do this. However, new arrivals are often Medicare ineligible, and this is an important leap forward in terms of providing equality of services or equivalence of services uh, across the community, including to Medicare ineligible individuals. The pandemic restrictions have highlighted the social capital and wealth that people bring to Australia and create when they get here. If we ever are going to eliminate HIV transmission in this country, and if we want to live up to our reputation as a safe place to work, study and get ahead, we must push for equivalent preventive services for the entire population, including recent arrivals and for the Medicare ineligible. And I again want to thank the Minister for today's announcement, uh, and we look forward to going the rest of the way. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you so much, Nick. And uh, the next question really uh, off the back of that is uh, to Brent Clifton. Since the beginning of the HIV epidemic uh, more than 40 years ago, those most touched by it have, uh, have powered the response and driven response directly associated with it. Can you reflect on what the, that means today, even with such extraordinary medical and scientific advances, the role of people who've been driving that response, particularly those affected and of course those affected communities. Uh, thank you, Tim. Um, I just want to thank the, uh, the parliamentary friends uh, for Action on HIV for inviting me to speak here today uh, on behalf of my community, which is people living with HIV. Um, it really is a humbling uh, honour. Um, and can I just echo uh, Nick and Tony's sentiments um, around the announcement from Minister Hunt on Medicare and eligibles um, gaining access to treatment. I spent the best part of the last 10 years providing peer support to people newly diagnosed 
uh, with HOV, this announcement will make a massive difference um, to their lives and their quality of life. Um, so look, I, I had a, I've had a very reflective moment uh, when I was preparing my answer to this, um, uh, thinking about how I have learned and, and the, the people who I've learned from um, over the last uh, 10 years um, of, I guess, my career within this sector, but also uh, my own uh, life as a HIV positive person. Uh, and I sort of needed to start with uh, the, the Denver principles to frame up um, uh, what, I, what I think we have as a, as a starting point. So the Denver principles, uh, for those of you who are unaware, um, uh, come from a June 1983 meeting um, of the fifth gay, annual Gay and Lesbian Health Conference. Uh, and at the end of that conference, uh, the group uh, uh, provided a manifesto which articulated a series of responsibilities for clinicians uh, and rights for people with AIDS. Um, the principle start with this paragraph. We condemn attempts to label us as victims, a term which implies defeat. We are only occasionally patients, a term which implies passivity, helplessness and dependence upon the care of others. We are people with AIDS. Uh, these words really are, I guess, the genesis of the self-empowerment movement in health, um, and they capture in such a powerful way uh, the centrality of positive voices and our experiences within the HIV response. Um, over the past 40 years, there have been some really amazing achievements um, uh, in the treatment space, for example. Uh, positive people have literally given their bodies uh, to research uh, so as to enable those of us living with HIV today to, to lead healthy, uh, longer lives. Um, and the uh, action to uh, bring new drugs to market uh, from uh, almost uh, very minimal uh, clinical uh, uh, trial data um, to get it out into the community uh, benefiting uh, people. Uh, it really has been a remarkable uh, set of ex uh, experiences that people with HIV uh, have added over the last 40 years. Um, but Tim, you just asked me about uh, uh, those most touched by the epidemic. Um, and these are my friends. These are people I love. Um, these are people I love dearly. They're my colleagues. Uh, they're my peers. They're people I look up to. Uh, and they're the people today that I want to celebrate uh, what they've done for us. Um, I just want to leave this little, uh, my, my response with um, uh, framing up uh, how I get to view um, people with HIV uh, on a timeline. Um, so I, I'm lucky enough to work with uh, some very talented colleagues uh, on an initiative called the Positive Leadership Development Institute. And at the beginning of this workshop, uh, and the, the initiative uh, is uh, a weekend which aims to skill and empower new generations of positive leaders, activists, storytellers, and support workers. And to start off this workshop, we have what we call a living timeline. It has a beginning point, uh, but it has no end point. And we constantly ask people uh, to contribute to this timeline uh, as the, uh, the weekend goes on. We give them three pieces of paper. We uh, ask them to put uh, a post-it note on the year that they first heard about AIDS. We ask them to put uh, a post-it note on the year they first met someone with AIDS. And we ask them to put a post-it note uh, on the year that they were diagnosed. And to take a step back, uh, every time we do this exercise, you get to see that the, the HIV story uh, includes many of us. We enter it at different points. Um, however, we are part of uh, many, many big experiences. And I, I just, I just want to reflect today that, uh, you know, when you're diagnosed with HIV, uh, you join a community, but you also join a family. Uh, you instantly share common experiences with complete strangers who for no other reason but you have HIV uh, and now exactly like you. Um, so I just want to celebrate uh, the 40 years that have come before us um, and honour those who have not uh, been lucky enough to, to share in the successes with us. Um, and I just acknowledge that there are many future uh, HIV act, uh, leaders on this call today. Uh, I'll call out people like Nick Hollis and Michelle Toven, uh, two colleagues who do really wonderful work in this space. Uh, and we're very lucky to have uh, leaders in this space to empower us towards the next 40 years. So thank you for the opportunity to speak today. 
Thanks so much, Brent, and uh, you're 100% right. There, everybody on this call needs to be acknowledged for the contribution that they've made uh, on this journey and uh, thank them for the continued work they're doing, particularly when there are people in the sector, uh, of course, who are doing it um, from all different angles and different perspectives, and as you rightly acknowledge often, um, because it comes down to their own lived experience and contribution and the role that they play to help others. So thank you for that. Uh, next question is to Jason Ong. For the first time in the Global Fund's history, results have gone backwards during COVID-19, something that I think, you know, will distress us all and shows you how much prioritisation and keeping these issues on the agenda matters so much. What initiatives are needed to reverse this trend? Of course, we just had an announcement uh, from the Minister, so that will be part of it, but there are many more things to come, particularly as we look to Agenda 2025. Thank you so much, Tim, for that question. Um, these results are definitely a big worry for us. Um, although the world has made significant progress in recent decades, our important global targets for 2020 were not met. Then COVID hit and delayed things even further. So this really is an urgent issue. If we don't want to lose all that we have painstakingly gained in our fight against HIV AIDS in the last 40 years. Um, so your question is very, very important, but it's a complex one that we pr probably could spend a whole day discussing. But I'd like to summarize these uh, initiatives we need by emphasizing the four key messages that the World Health Organization has issued for World AIDS Day. So number one is to recommit to ending HIV transmission. So you've heard that uh, UNAIDS high-level meeting on AIDS this year it was pro uh, proudly co-chaired by Australia. Uh, was really a pivotal moment for, for our globe um, to garner that political commitment to truly end HIV as a public health threat by 2030. And for Australia, um, Agenda 2025 is that critical document and the call for recommitment to appropriately resource our response in this last leg. Uh, number two is to tackle HIV and COVID together. I think there's so many overlaps in a way that we can deal with both infections and we can certainly synergize our efforts using the examples that Peter and others have already mentioned. And as our COVID response has um, kind of demonstrated, um, political will plus good science can really lead to um, positive change in our society. The third point is to focus on equality. I think we must ensure that everyone everywhere has equal access to HIV prevention, testing, treatment, and care, regardless of the visa status. So really appreciate um, the announcements from the government today. And as Nick has already mentioned, um, we are seeing a divergent epidemic in our, in our nation, where for example, the HIV notification rates for overseas born gay bisexual men is three times higher than Australian born gay bisexual men due to stark inequalities in several domains. And fourthly, um, to concentrate on those left behind. So these include the diverse groups of people being marginalized in each country. So including what we call the key populations of people at, at higher risk. And for example, in our region, in the Asia Pacific region, um, UNA estimates that a whopping 98% of new infections occur amongst key populations and their sexual partners. So we must do uh, a lot better there. So let me end by saying that the HIV pandemic uh, will not be over for us until it is over for everyone. Um, so yes, we must continue our wonderful work in Australia, but we must also look beyond our borders um, to help our neighboring countries in their fight against HIV. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Um, I've got a question now for Carol Trelaw. Stigma we know might be easing, but it still presents barriers to treatment and prevention. So what are the practical steps we need to take to overcome this? Hello everyone, and thanks very much for the opportunity to be involved. I think we need to be bold and ambitious in the Australian response to HIV stigma. We've got to get over the notion of stigma as something that happens um, only one-to-one -one and in terms of individual interactions. Stigma is embedded within our systems and structures. We need to interrogate those and work towards changing them. If we keep only training, running training programs for workers in health or social services, we'll only ever be chipping away at a very small corner of a large stigma block. I think the second 
major goal, ambition, practical step for Australia's response to HIV stigma is to really engage with um, notions of HIV intersecting with the broad categories of race, gender and class. We've heard numerous people talk about marginalised communities within the HIV sector and those um, groups being less serviced, left behind by our current uh, systems and processes. So to deal with stigma at a systems and structures level and ensure that we are not leaving people behind, that we're engaging fully, openly with all the best science we have in issues of stigma with HIV intersecting with race, gender and class. Thank you. Thanks, Carla, for uh, that question, for that answer, I should say. And um, I think we're all aware of the big challenges that are faced around making sure we get to all of the different parts of the community. And if there, where, where there is stigma, it needs to be addressed, unpacked to make sure that there isn't structural barriers or we don't allow the continuation of structural barriers, uh, which create a problem for those uh, living with HIV and, of course, around diagnosis and to get to t key targeted populations. Uh, final uh, question is to Sharon Lewin. Um, Sharon, you're, like everyone else on this call, a uh, significant leader in the space and in the health space. In two years, we've achieved effective vaccines for COVID-19, um, something we should all be very happy with and, uh, and celebrate. But what Firstly, can we learn from that experience for dealing with HIV and what is needed ultimately to achieve an HIV vaccine or cure, as we all read every day uh, in the press about uh, the potential of mRNA or other uh, potential technologies? Yeah, thanks, Tim. And let me start by saying how wonderful it is to see everyone here and um, how much I wish we could be in the same room, much see representation from both sides of government um, year in, year out is just fabulous to see. So thank you, everyone. And also special thanks um, to the Minister and Government for announcing access to funding for Medicare and eligibles. It's a huge advance and a great day to hear that. So um, Tim's asked me about um, what's needed for an HIV vaccine and cure and what we've learned from COVID-19. So first of all, I don't need to tell this audience, but you know, the finding a vaccine and a cure is sort of the last great scientific challenge, or I should say shared challenge that we must address to see the end of HIV. People often say to me, do we really need a vaccine and cure? We've got great prevention strategies. We've got PrEP, we've got now long acting PrEP, we've got ART, we're gonna have long acting ART. Do we really need it? Well, I think COVID's, taught us that yes, we do, that these systems are actually fragile. That in the setting of a pandemic, we've seen reduction in access to prevention strategies, as we just heard from Peter and others. We've seen reduction in people accessing ART. And we also know that these programs cost the world a very large amount of money. It's not that we don't need or that this is at risk, but it's estimated to get 95% of people on treatment, the world will need $30 billion a year. So these are fragile um, systems and it's so easy for those systems to break, which is why we need an enduring solution like a vaccine. PrEP is fabulous, but it's fragile and requires a significant ongoing investment. A vaccine will end that. And of course, a cure, a, an answer for people to not have to have lifelong antiretroviral therapy. And COVID has shown us what's possible with, you know, great innovation, extensive collaboration, buy-in from the private sector and significant amounts of funding. However, we shouldn't be tricked into thinking that if we had all that, we could have a vaccine and cure in two years as well. We need to go faster for a vaccine and cure, but these are very, very difficult problems for us to solve. And COVID, the advances in COVID-19 will, will give benefit to the progress to finding a vaccine and cure, but the science is very, very different. We'll learn what we can from COVID, but we need to recognise that these are much more challenging problems. I just want to say one thing that has made a difference to COVID, and I think we still need in defining a vaccine and a cure uh, beyond um, 
the funding and beyond the collaboration and, and getting partnerships. And that's really around innovation, that, you know, great breakthroughs in science happen through lateral areas that we never know are going to um, yield those outcomes. And a great example of that is RNA. Many of you will know that mRNA started with HIV 20 years ago, Drew Weissman, a well-known HIV scientist, and Katie Carrico, a Hungarian scientist who began exploring the concept of mRNA. And no one believed or thought it was a great idea. Drew Weissman did, and he started working with Katie Carrico on seeing whether mRNA could solve the issue of an HIV vaccine. And it just shows us that if you don't fund discovery research, if you don't fund blue sky ideas, we're not going to get the breakthrough that we need. And we still need those breakthroughs um, in our quest to find an HIV vaccine and cure. And finally, Australia has got a tremendous amount to offer. We have had a system in place across the country which drives collaboration in science, collaboration with, partner, part, with community partners through our national centres, through the Australian Centre for HIV and Hepatitis. This has been a tremendous framework for collaboration and investment in new science. But I think we can't underestimate the funding that it's going to need. We've got a lot to offer in all aspects of discovery, science, clinical research and implementation. So I hope on this World AIDS Day and that we end with a message of hope. Um, we've come so far for the last 40 years. We've come so far because of innovation, collaboration and ambition. And I hope we continue that for the next, I don't I'm going to say 40 years, I'll give it 10 years uh, so that we're all here to enjoy it, um, but that we continue that, that fight, not only on implementing what works, but making sure we get these final final um, answers to these great challenges of a vaccine and cure. And COVID is, has, has hope inspired all of us that we can do it. Thanks a lot, Tim. Thank you so much, Sharon. It's my pleasure to be able to close today's uh, breakfast proceedings. And I start by remembering today, everyone we have lost over the four, last 40 years. I'm sorry we're not able to be together, but I think we've done a really good job in having a worthwhile event online this morning in the true spirit of the event that Bill Botel uh, kicked us off with 10 years ago. And uh, I look, look forward to seeing all your faces again in person soon. Uh, I wanna thank all of our speakers today uh, it's just incredible every year to be able to, if you follow these events and been part of them over the last decade, as I have, our capacity uh, to be able to tell the story of what's happened over the last 40 years, but all of the advances that have happened in the last 10. Peter Sands highlighted for us that Australia is part of global efforts that make a real difference and that it's not just a global response, but it's very much a community response right around the world that we're empowering. I too am especially proud of Australia's leadership at the United Nations this year, and in particular for the way uh, affected communities and civil society were able to take a leadership role in that, uh, even within the kind of online environment that that was held. Uh, I'm also delighted at the Medicare ineligibility and the peak funding, and Mark Butler has conveyed his support for those announcements as well. And I'm really struck in these COVID times really to, to note that uh, it's clearly a no-brainer to be when treatment is also an act of prevention, uh, that we should really be recognising the very fundamentals of how access to treatment for Medicare ineligibility, ineligible people, uh, in fact, uh, it supports their health, but in fact, it uh, supports and protects the health of the whole population. I'm really looking forward to seeing the deepening of the Agenda 2025 uh, uh, approach that's been so clearly costed and outlined bringing together scientists, positive and affected communities, health systems. And as Sharon uh, highlighted, we really need to be able to drive uh, towards 
a cure uh, because uh, our responses can be fragile, but I also know that with the kind of leadership that we have in this sector and what has been outlined in Agenda 2025, that we're able to overcome much of that fragility by being really strong together and being bringing that bipartisan, strong networks across scientists, communities, health systems, human rights, reducing stigma, all of that makes an incredible difference. I want to extend on behalf of my co-chair, Tim Wilson, our thanks to AFEO, NAPWA and all of the organisations that have come together today and to extend on behalf of the Parliamentary Action Group for HIV, AIDS, Bloodborne Viruses and STIs, our thanks and also a sense of empowerment uh, because it is a great privilege to work with all of you. Best wishes for World AIDS Day. I hope it is a successful and productive one for all of you.